Hi, this is Dr. Carl Goldcamp. A um, few things I have to say. One is we personally are involved both as a lifestyle, a ketogenic diet, but also through my 16 years of clinical practice of what is effective. What do people need to take sometimes, all the time, to support their ketogenic diet? You'll get bits and pieces of this ongoing week after week. It's important to be comprehensive. In one way, it's simple. and one way, it's a little bit complicated. Hi, welcome back for another episode of the Keto Naturopath. This is Dr. Carl Goldcamp. Today, we're going to open a can of worms. Uh, perhaps we've done that on past occasions in your mind, and I'm uh, hoping that hasn't been the case, that it's been a little more structured on what we're going to talk about, and what we did talk about. But today, we're going to be talking about fats. And I, it, it's going to be a topic on which I'm going to start, and there will be at least two other podcasts to further to go further with this. So it's going to be sort of a general, but actually we're going to get into some details that may bother you and uh, be hard to hold in your mind. But just listen to the story and as we get into this. I think it's important to know. And as, as always, I want you to always be asking yourself the question as you're listening to these particular podcasts, you know, what is the connection with what Dr. Goldcamp's talking about right now to ketosis, to the ketogenic diet, to uh, being healthy, okay? That's that's the basis. Everything comes from there. And the reason that is the core from which every podcast should flourish from, whether it's an interview or a topic that I'm covering or, or something else, that um, the ketogenic diet is been the most profound thing that's ever happened in my life. And I've always shocked at, well, wait a minute, I'm the guy that went to medical school. I went to naturopathic medical school. I was the top of my class. And I should have known these things. But no, after 16 years, maybe I started hearing a little bit about it after 15 years, but after 16 years of clinical practice, how is it that I had not thoroughly embraced this and had not been introduced to it? And uh, for all the medical conferences I went to, which were primarily uh, naturopathic medical conferences, some environmental medical conferences and acupuncture and Chinese herbal medicine, but primarily it was naturopathic and environmental. Why is it I hadn't heard this before? And it wasn't until I got very, very sick, did and, and actually a year plus after that, did I start looking into rechecking my thinking. You know, what else could I do for my gut issue that clearly was, you know, keeping me at death's doorstep? And then what about my wife's health? You know, she had the uh, meningioma and uh, a 13-hour brain surgery. Uh, how did that happen? And you can say, well, things happen. You know, it's genetics. We, have, we toss everything into the genetic uh, bucket. If we don't know, it's genetics. Yeah, it's mostly environmental and it's mostly how we live our lives and it's mostly due to dietary consumption that we build our body on. So anyway, that's the foundation from which we're going to begin. So I think we need to talk about fats, what fats are, different kinds of fats, and why that's important to you. So I'm going to start from the outside first. And what I mean by that is that I bet everybody here has taken aspirin sometime in their life. And then others of you said, no, I take Tylenol. Well, good for you. And others take something else, okay? So why do you do that? Oh, because I'm in pain or because I want to break a fever or because, okay, you want to do it for that symptom. It could be a serious symptom if somebody's fever spikes too high, especially if we're thinking about children. Parents get worried. Fevers have a place, by the way. If you break a fever too early, you actually prolong the particular uh, uh, virus, you know, and you're actually limiting your body from getting rid of it. So you that's why you let the fever go for a while. You obviously don't let it go too high because fevers can be a problem as well, but not with a little fever. And fevers with children, pediatrics tend to rise quickly and they tend to fall quickly as well. Okay then, so why'd we go there? Why'd we talk about aspirin, Tylenol? acetaminophen, because if it wasn't for the kind of fats that you eat in your life, that headache that you're trying to treat, that spiking fever, that arthralgia, joint pain, your PMS, your cramp, even digestive cramps, any sorts of pain conducting to you that you are aware of is in part caused 
by the fats that you have. I hope you're interested. I hope, I hope that piqued your interest. So here's why. So that's from the outside first. In other words, so these little things, these little things being the aspirin, the Tylenol, the acetaminophen, those are the things that actually inhibit a particular reaction that depends on the fats that you have. So it inhibits a particular reaction. Okay, so hold that thought. I put that out there saying everybody should be concerned about fats because we have all and or still do take these particular medications because we think they are the harmless medications. I'm not going to get into the side effects of the medications, but I'm going to tell you basically what their function is and uh, what you can do to, uh, to vastly reduce your need on those particular medications, over-the-counter medications. Okay, so here's our basic terminology about fats. We know fats, there's three different kinds of fats in the body, I mean categories of fats. So we have cholesterol, yep, that's a fat. We have phospholipids, yep, that's a fat. We have lipids, yep, that's a fat. So all those are fats. And so what is the difference? Lipids, as I'm talking about lipids, I want everybody to, to pinch their belly, however skinny or heavy you are. And that little pinch of fat that you have between your fingers right now is you're, you're pinching your fat cells, right? You're adipocytes. And inside those adipocytes, and an adipocyte is like is a cell. So we'll consider a cell like a water balloon. So in this particular water balloon, the water, for this analogy, is really fats. They're triglycerides. Those are three different fatty acids tied together in uh, with a glycerol backbone. So let me give you a visual illustration of that. We're not going to go too far. The visual is, uh, illustration is the letter E, or you can say, or, or the number three, however you want to look at it. Let's say the letter E. I like the angularity of the letter E versus three. So of each prong of the letter E is a place where a fatty acid will attach. So you're going to have three fatty acids attached to a letter E. And that those three fatty acids tied together, and that letter E is going to be glycerol. You're learning something here, eh? And so that's going to be a triglycerol. So for instance, my favorite product, of course, is the caprylic acid triglyceride, meaning there's three fatty acids of C8 tied together in a glycerol background. So it's caprylic acid triglyceride. So they come in all sorts of combinations. So everything in your body, your fat floats around as a triglyceride. Your fat is stored in you as a triglyceride. So the lipids is all about fat that is going to be used for burning energy. Not all fat is going to be used for burning energy. We have structural fats. They go to make cell membranes. We have cholesterol. Cholesterol is also a structural fat. A lot of different, you know, it's a lot different. I'm not going to go into the structures, but just know that like we're building, uh, we're making a building here and the building's going to be made of fat, but some of that fat is going to be for the energy to make the building run. Some of that fat is going to be, you know, building the floors, the the uh, structures, the I-beams and the floors, that's the, we'll call it the cholesterol. And then the phospholipids will provide, you know, the finer wiring. So, okay, so now we know that lipids are in the fat cells and that's the source of your energy. Good for us. So all that has to do with ketosis. So when we talk about fats, having fats and fats that qu quickly uh, convert into ketones, we're talking about lipids. And uh, lipids primarily are made of uh, saturated fats, hence that's what caprylic acid is, um, Some, maybe some uh, mono unsaturated fatty acids, but primarily they're all saturated fats in our fat cells. So it's ready little packets of fat energy ready to go when we need to call upon them. Okay, good enough. So I need to tell you about how cells, those membranes. So even in the lipid cell, within this lipid cell is, is, the, is the lipids, that's going to be our energy fats, but the membrane of the fat cell and the membrane of all cells are not made of lipids. They're made of thing called phospholipids, obviously because they contain phosphate, <laughs> but it's not so important really at this point. But the fats that are used in the phospholipids are the polyunsaturated fats. 
So the polyunsaturated fats. Polyunsaturated fats are actually an essential fatty acid that we have to go out in the world and eat. We can't make these. So we have two different kinds of... So now we're talking about a water balloon, right? We're going to say the cell is a water balloon, and now I'm just talking about the balloon. I'm not talking about the contents. I'm not going to get into the organelles or any of that stuff. I'm just talking about the cell, the, the water balloon itself. So if you picture a great big water balloon, and I take it in my hands, and I throw it on the desk and splat it, we're going to realize how little, small, the cell membrane actually is. It's that thin, thin, thin outer covering, okay? That's all we're talking about, the structure of that outer covering. So now I said that the, the membrane is made up of phospholipids, and of the phospholipids, each phospholipid is two polyunsaturated fat. It's kind of like a, a hairpin that's pinched. On one side, it's one fatty acid, it's one um, polyunsaturated fatty acid, and the other side is another polyunsaturated fatty acid. Where they are joined is called a head. And where they're not joined, it's called a tail. Why do you need to know that? Because uh, in this water balloon membrane, the outside is going to be um, lipophilic, uh, lipophobic, that is, a, a kind of not to be uh, attracted to water. And the inside is going to be attracted to water. So you have a head and a tail. That's what it is. So if we don't eat polyunsaturated fats, we have a problem. We have a problem. You know, it's, you're just not going to work out well. You're going to have a lot of deficiencies. And so cell membranes are going to have holes in them. Cell membranes, your neurology, your neurons are also made of very much fats and their membranes are similar. And so you're going to have neurological problems. So a lack of an appropriate amount of polyunsaturated fatty acids is going to lead to a lot of problems. So that's a dietary thing. You know, you can't, you know, that's in one way is why we take the fish oils and we take fats as supplements. But, you know, you can get this in food and diets. And that's how we did for thousands and thousands and hundreds of thousands of years. So I'm now from the perspective that you don't really need supplements at all, except in very acute and limited situations for a short period of time. That's my reference now. And I come to that after 16 years of having a huge pharmacy in which we, uh, I won't say we were encouraged, but... When you tried to change people's situation, you said, you're going to take these supplements and you're going to please do it this way. And after you get better, you can go find your own supplements if you really think they're cheaper someplace else. But right now we're going to do it my way. You're going to get better and then you can go change and find out that I wasn't lying to you. You really needed these particular supplements. But if you're not going to change your diet and you have a lousy diet, then you'll be, dep you'll be dependent on supplements. And then you always be looking for the next little supplement that's going to improve your situation. And it's an endless little, I wouldn't even say it's a circle. It's, you get lost in it. So let's talk about diet. So polyunsaturated fats you need in your diet, EPA, oh, sorry, gave away part of it. Um, of these polyunsaturated fats that make up the membrane of all your cells, they come down to two categories. You have either an omega-6, which is uh, primarily animal fats, animal specifically meaning from meat, I know fish technically are animals, but I'm not considering that in this particular case. And you need omega-3s. I know we've all heard omega-3s. So omega-3s have two different kinds of fats that we should eat. I'm giving you this simplistic. Somebody can argue technically that there's a third, and we're not going to get into that. We're just going to say it's EPA and DHA. And I'm not going to give you the... Not, not, to, not to get into what those acronyms stand for. Let's keep it simple. So EPA and DHA are both omega-3s, and DHA is highly concentrated in the brain, and EPA is in both uh, fat cells um, and all cells, given the phospholipids. And, but the DHA has a much higher concentration in the brain and in the rest of the body, so that's very interesting. So that's really important. So if you're thinking about your uh, a little baby growing, or a mother who's who's uh, growing a baby or is pregnant with a growing child, that um, having the right kinds of fats for your child is probably pretty important, wouldn't you say? Okay, so what is the omega-6? The omega-6 is, as I say, comes from animal fats. And the fancy word for that, we have no acronym for it other than AA, but we'll call it arachidonic acid, AA, arachidonic acid. Okay, 
So now what I've just told you, you have in essence two different types of fats that are essential. You have to go out in the world and bring them in by food. And I say, you know, parenthetically, yes, by supplements, but food, and this has been studied, when you get your fats for, for food, it gets incorporated into you uh, a lot more efficiently than do supplements. Not all supplements, by the way, are incorporated into you. That's the big sort of uh, factor that's not talked about when we talk about supplementation. How much of this stuff that I'm having will actually help me or get into, be part of me? Not much, actually. So food is better. Yay food and good food. Okay, so now we have two different types of fats. We have this water balloon membrane, um, balloon membrane of all cells that are made up of these polyunsaturated fatty acids, and there's little islands of cholesterol throughout that. The reason I'm asking you to have that visualization, and I told you about aspirin and acetaminophen and Tylenol out there, and if for those of you who are a little more medically inclined, you hear about COX-1 inhibitors, COX-2 inhibitors. Okay, let's get to it. Well, if if one was a person who just ate store-bought meat and didn't even care if it was grass-fed or not, just give me meat, red meat, all the time, uh, they would be very high in arachidonic acid. Also, the fats that are also generally in uh, vegetable oils like corn oil and soy and peanuts and uh, um, we'll leave it at that for the time being are also omega-6 oils, okay? So those omega-6 are very pro-inflammatory. Pro-inflammatory. How do we know that? Well, obviously well studied. But so that's the that's the omega-6 area, pro-inflammatory. The omega-3, polyunsaturated fats, the EPA, DHA, are for the most part anti-inflammatory. You'll hear that a lot. That's not new information, and that's kind of, that's at least 25 years old, if not 50 years old. That's the basic of the of the just eating fats that come from meat and or vegetable oils and let's let me wedge in a little parenthesis here the whole contrivance of having vegetable oils on your food really certainly isn't 100 years old it's for the most part 50 60 years old so we have you know when vegetable oil started which is basically corn oil and then soy and then peanut and safflower and blah 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 um that, you know, we didn't, that wasn't the natural way of cooking. You basically used lard to cook with. So if you were cooking in a pan, an iron cast pan, 200 years ago, it would have been lard you were using primarily as fat. Uh, and if you were in the tropics, maybe you're using coconut oil. I don't know enough about the history of fats to speak truly to that. But that would be my guess. Absolutely, that would be my guess. So we have this whole variable of food called vegetable oils that came in that were actually very pro-inflammatory. So what I'm saying is you can get your omega-6s from your vegetable oils. Um, I don't even have any brand names, but I can picture the the bottle of the vegetable oil ever uses and their salad dressings and their cooking with and so on. But the problem with the only source of your anti-inflammatory fats was fish. And primarily... Oh, the fish story on omega-3. It's the best sources of omega-3 fatty acids are really uh, Alaskan caught salmon, um, marine fish, and that means from the ocean, and um, leave it at that. But there's also a problem with a lot of fish, a lot of big fish, uh, have a lot of heavy metal toxicity. So that's why we resort to salmon as being the single best source of natural fish fat. And sardines. So you have bigger fish and smaller fish. Basically, they both those fish are too small and uh, to accumulate, to bioaccumulate the heavy metals that are out there. A lot of other fish uh, do, and that's why tuna has warnings on it for the mercury content. There are much bigger fish that ate the smaller fish, that ate the smaller fish, and you know it came up that way. So it's bioaccumulation. So salmon or sardines, for the most part, that's the simple answer. We go down species by species. We could talk about trout versus that. And all that depends on where you caught it. Uh, it. I had spent a number of years in Connecticut, and most of all the freshwater lakes had mercury toxicity warnings. You know, the fish that you get here most likely will be very high in mercury. 
you know, take at your own risk. Really? You can give a fishing license and then you can have the warnings on the, on the lakes and the ponds that the fish out here might be high in mercury. Why don't you just like not have people fish in a, in a mercury toxic lake? So where did the mercury come from? It came from uh, acid rain, by the way, acid rain that was fallout from coal burning plants. Okay. A little bit of a, uh, a digression, but not really. It's I'm saying this is a sort of a, a general introduction to give you an idea of fats and why they're important and why you all are actually exercising your understanding or lack of understanding of fat by the foods you eat. So here you go. The person who had, you know, hamburgers and hot dogs and vegetable oils and the fats that were put into all the pre-made foods, you would be very tilted. And it's a number of studies have been on this. The average American has a ratio of omega-6s, arachidonic acid, primarily, to omega-3s, about 20 to 1. Whereas if we were to, what they think is healthy is a ratio of 1 to 1 of omega-3s, that's the EPA and DHA, we'll call them fish fats. And there's a little bit of EPA and DHA in in grass-fed animals, but the percentage is so small, it's not really worth talking about. So when somebody goes, oh, wait a minute, I heard there was omega-3 in, in grass re- grass-fed beef. Correct. Unequivocally correct. But it is so little that it's really nothing. Okay? So we've got that covered. So what I would say when, when patients came in, to have them understand this particular point, I said, if, I, if we were going to do a six-week trial And I kept you from eating fish completely and certainly didn't get any fish oil supplements. And you just go on and eat the diet you're apparently eating already. And um, your pain will probably get worse. So let's do another six-week intervention and say we're not going to eat red meat to keep it simple for these people. I'm not saying we had to. I'm just trying to make it black and white. Let's try to keep it simple and say, now we're just going to eat the salmon or the sardines, and we have to figure out how to make it interesting for them, and and, or take uh, fish supplements, but better to emphasize the food part first. So we would find they would come back six weeks later, and whatever reason they saw me for, apart from cancer, uh, their aches and pains would have decreased, their sleep would have gotten better, their sense of energy would have gotten better, and that was simply because we used a different fat that made a different kind of prostaglandin. So now their their prostaglandins would have been rich in omega-3s and less rich in the omega-6s, the arachidonic acid, okay? So what happens is this, is the story kind of stops there for 90% of the explanation, and you can probably get that kind of explanation. Omega-3s are anti-inflammatory and omega-6s are inflammatory, but I like to go a little further. Because here's how it goes. When you start, if I was to, if you were to bump into a bookshelf and bruise yourself in your in your arm, your arm won't be sore. So what happens then in that particular reaction is that the reaction is set up is that your body releases what they call prostaglandins. And so where the prostaglandins are a fat molecule in essence, but what happens, it sets up an enzyme that goes to clip off a portion of those fats that are part of your cell membrane, right? The water balloon. They're going to go to the, 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 the seal of the water balloon, clip off some fat. And if you're primarily an arachidonic acid consumer, right? You're a vegetable oil meat eater of the poor quality meats. You're going to be a very high in arachidonic acid, and they're going to make a certain set a certain kind of prostaglandins. Now, let your imaginary double who eats only fish over there, their kind of, their water balloon mem- cell membrane would be made up primarily of omega-3s, DHA and EPA. So when that enzyme goes to clip off a fat to make the prostaglandin, it's going to go um, make a whole different kind of prostaglandin that actually is less pain-causing and has a few other features. So these things called prostaglandins 
are necessary for us. They are the ones that say, just hit your arm, it's sore, protect your arm, right? So pain has its place. Pain is just not a bad thing. It has a good thing. It also has to do with setting up inflammation. You're going to find your, your shoulder is going to swell. By the way, in all these other aspects, you know, there's prostaglandins are a big part of childbirth. A woman gives off prostaglandins to help protect herself. You know, there is, there's that pain, but it has other, other features as well. One of the other features of prostaglandins are, you know, setting up your blood clotting. So if you cut your arm, you'd like your body not to bleed forever, correct? You'd want it to sort of set up to clot somewhat and to seal off that hole and to start to repair itself. So its clotting factor, its thrombocytes that, that are also made from these same kind of fats, the thrombocytes that are made from arachidonic acid that came from that same situation that I've just told you about are very pro-clot. They clot very quickly. And those that come from EPA, DHA, fish oil don't clot that quickly. So I bet most of you already know this, and I'm sorry for this sort of technicality, but they say, well, if you have a lot of fish oil, you know, tell your doctor before surgery if you're on fish oil and or vitamin E, as I would say, because you will bleed longer. Yep. Well, the reason you will bleed longer, and basically you probably will bleed what should have been the norm, but since everybody else has a crappy diet, you know, of high arachidonic acid, they clot very quickly. So the average patient that comes in clots quickly. That's what they're used to. You come in with a healthier diet and you clot not as quickly. Well, depending what the degree of surgery is, if they need, you know, there's a lot of surgery and there's going to be a lot of bleeding, they need to know that. And they'll probably say, let's wait and, and take you off the fish oil for a while so you don't clot, you know, so the bleed time, as they would say, is shorter. Okay, we understand that. So one makes you bleed not longer, but just not clot as quickly. So you can say, well, I want to clot quickly. It sounds like a healthy thing. If you're, if you're cut, if you got a gashing wound, it's a natural good thing to have in terms of a survival ability is to clot, of course. But these clots are also clots that are thrown off in the non-injured part of us that we could call thrombosis. These are clots that happen in our arteries and our veins and so on and so forth. So they are not a good thing if you're a hyperclotter. Those are my words. If you have a propensity to clot more easily than others, that's a problem. That's a health risk. Okay, so that's why you hear about if you're to have fish oils makes you clot less frequently if you have an issue of clotting. All right, so that's interesting. So now we went from the fat that is part of this membrane on your cell, and depending on if you're a fish eater or a animal eater, and you know I'm including vegetable oils in that as well, that you are either one not only a hyper hyper clotter, or you'll clot much uh, more quickly. But you will be in much more pain. You'll have worse headaches. Or if we're just using that, I banged my elbow or banged my arm against the bookcase. Your shoulder is going to hurt a lot more than this or my shoulder if I'm the fish eater. Okay, so that's the difference. You're going to feel more pain. You're going to clot more quickly. And you're going to be much more inflamed. It's going to be redder and it's going to be more swollen. Isn't that interesting? All because of the fats that we take. So I said I would bring this back to aspirin, acetaminophen, and... Uh, Tylenol. Well, because aspirin, fancy name of aspirin is called salicylic acid. Maybe that's interesting to you. Maybe not. It comes from willow bark, and obviously now it's various plants. Now it's, of course, 100% synthetic. But salicylic acid, and the reason it was say, hey, take willow bark for your headache is because salicylic acid, saying it for the third and fourth time now, actually inhibits that enzyme that goes to clip off that piece of fat from the membrane to make those prostaglandins. So it stops a, it stops a portion of the prostaglandins from being made. And now there's actually different enzymes that go to the cell membrane to clip off the fat to make the prostaglandin. So it would break off, and then en that enzyme is called cyclooxygenase. Anyway, so aspirin inhibits cyclooxygenase not for the whole body, but just for some. So therefore, when you take it, your headache's going to be less than it was. You know, your bumped shoulder is going to be less inflamed than it was. It's going to be uh, not clot. That's why I say, hey, if you're taking aspirin, you're not going to clot as quickly. Well, the reason you're not as clotting as quickly is you've, by taking aspirin, have just stopped those prostaglandins from being made. And remember I said, if you were the animal fat consumer, you were going to clot more quickly. 
And if you were the uh, fish consumer, you're going to clot less quickly. So that's what aspirin does. And uh, the pharmaceuticals of COX-1 inhibitor and COX-2 inhibitors, they do the same thing. They're just pharmaceuticals. So that's really interesting. Eh? So we're talking about the fats you eat will drive the pain that you feel on a per injury basis or per PMS basis or per pain you feel during childbirth, uh, per headache, per migraine, per athletic injury, per muscle soreness after working out. So all these things will be many magnitudes of degree difference because of the fats that you eat. So what I'm not saying is that you need to eat all EPA, you need to eat all omega-3s and no arachidonic acid. I'm saying our standard American diet defaults so much to the omega-6s that we have a 20 to 1 ratio and that's been, and there's tests. So you can go when you get your checkup, you can ask, I would like my fatty acid profile. You know, I would like actually to be more specific than that. Say, I would like to know my omega-3 versus omega-6 ratio. They actually have that. Ask your doc for it. And it is not that sophisticated. It's not real esoteric, but it's a great test to know. So you will find, you know, what is the ratio? Ideally, you want to get to a 1-1. One, one. So if you are a standard American on a standard American diet and you what I've just described, and you probably fall into that, then you probably have a high arachidonic acid and a very low omega-3 ratio. So obviously what you do to that is you shift from, you get rid of the vegetable oils completely. Let's chuck that sucker. And um, you would cut back on your protein sources and not have it all be from red meat, but you would then switch it over to having your protein sources from fish, the salmon and the sardines, okay? And that would be actually a significant difference. Uh, you may or may not, or you can or can't, depending on what you feel, uh, take your fish oil supplements. So I'm saying fish oil supplements are unnecessary if you make dietary changes. If you totally refuse to make dietary changes for whatever reason, that's why they do make supplements. Pick a good omega-3 fish oil supplement. And then... I'm not going to get into the idea of krill oil, not in this talk, krill oil versus fish oil versus uh, microalgae, fatty acids. That's, those are interesting topics, and but down the road. Okay, so there's that fat, all right? There's inflammation, type of fat. We know the dietary sources, and we know why that exists. So the reason I'm sort of stumbling into this particular talk of fats, and I you know, now you know fats are cholesterol, phospholipids, which are your water balloon cell membrane. And then you have for fat cells, what's in fat cells are the uh, lipids, which is your standby ready energy fats. So I think that's a good uh, concept to know. And I want to go a little further with this because last time or the time before last, I talked about you know, why is it that the ketogenic diet benefits autism? And, you know, why is it that it's an antidepressive? And I talked about how ketones, in essence, are a, not just, you know, uh, having a preferred fuel for your mitochondria and that you, uh, you know, burn like less glucose and more ketones, but the ketones themselves are a metabolic Signal, signaling agent. So they actually talk to a lot of other aspects of your metabolism. As you would probably guess, things are just not that simple. But in the fact that it's a signaling metabolite, is a better way to say it, that what happens then is that we now have an increase, excuse me, that we now have an increase in GABA and a decrease in glutamate. And I explained that before, so I'm not going to go down that road again. But that is what made this such a significant difference. And I read a quote by somebody said, you know, it's it's such a stunningly, it's like a mild high with um, an ADA medication. I forgot what that was. And and that's exactly what it is. I call it being in the zone. It gives you an unprecedented sense of, sense of focus. It gives you a, a greater uh, attention span and it makes you a better listener and a better speaker as well. You're much more thoughtful in what you say and thoughtful on what you listen to, thoughtful where you spend your time, focused, focused, focused. Whether it's tennis, chess, writing your paper, taking an exam. So going 
back to the idea that I mentioned autism and uh, antidepressants. I also mentioned bipolar. So the idea that if we change our fats, the arachidonic acid to eat to more omega-3s, right? We get to that 1-1 one, one, uh, one, one ratio of our polyunsaturated fats. That change away from the 20 to 1 to the 1 to 1, eat omega-3s to omega-6, is a significant difference for uh, a number of conditions. It is a significant difference in uh, autism. It's a significant difference in depression. A significant difference in bipolar, and I can go on and on. So if you shifted that fat, and I would say if you're seriously listening to what I'm saying right now, I would have you really think about your diet than saying in a knee-jerk fashion, what supplements do I need to take? Because supplements are only a portion of your supplements are going to be absorbed and useful. And you got all these other things in supplements that are not just about the thing you're taking. So food is the best source. I know it's the more complicated approach, certainly the more holistic approach, but I'm going to add a layer to this. Okay. And this is a non-fat layer, so to say, to the conversation. I want to add a layer of what they call epigenetics. I know I'm opening a can of worms here, but epigenetics is this. I'll try to give you the skinny on it. First of all, I can go Google what epigenetics are, right? That's, that's the backup. But you have the human genome, which are your chromosomes. You know, what you got from your mom and what you got from your dad. That's the hardwire part. That's your chromosomes. And it's, if you see your chromosomes as your entire piano keys, right? So your entire piano keys are there. As you know, when you play the piano, if you do play the piano, is you don't play all your keys at the same time, right? You play some of your keys some of the times. And so what what your body has done or what your genes on top, epi is on top of, you know, how, how is it, how is it we have genes for so many different things that are never active, activated. So only certain genes are activated and other genes are in essence dormant. They slip by. So, so we have the piano keys, but we don't play all the keys. We just play certain keys. They only certain keys are activated. Okay. So epigenetics activates um, certain keys given our environmental situations. What does that mean? Environmental situations. Primarily that means dietary. That means stress. That means the internal biochemistry that changes with uh, a lot of things, but primarily it's going to be dietary. And you can say, well, environmental or toxins, all these things, right? But now we're, now we find that there is a, and this is only 20 years old for the most part, really 10, last 10 has become really pretty well defined. Okay. So now we have two different kinds of genes going on. Well, the problem is that, uh, we don't share the same genes. So if we said we have a hundred people with the color blonde hair, it's not just one gene they have. They have probably a hundred different varieties of a blonde hair gene. And I just sort of completely made that up. And so these variations we're going to call polymorphisms, different shapes, poly being Many morphisms being shaped. So these polymorphisms for the same gene exist in nearly everything. So now there's another multiplier effect. So what we started to look at, and certainly what I had looked at in my practice and many other physicians did too, this all started probably about 2004, were certain what they call single nuclear uh, polymorphisms. So that was just one amino acid that was one amino acid different than the basic gene we're looking at. So, um, so that's single nuclear, that's a nucleus, um, polymorphisms, we call them SNPs. So now there's a whole world of studying SNPs. So in the different polymorphisms, which now are, we're just going to look at the category, they're different by one a nucleic acid, I should have said, which then makes a different amino acid just one little difference. And so one of these most common kinds of SNPs is a thing called MTHFR. Okay. Bah. Why do you care about that? Because it's actually very important. It's very important to how efficient our epigenetics are. And so this SNP, 
MTHFR. I dare not give you the whole name for it. You'll just choke on the name. It's called methyl tetrahydrofolate reductase. So let's just call it MTHFR. And if it has to do with the methylation cycle and the folate, folate cycle. These are just biochemical cycles that work with us and we need to have them working. Okay, we'll go with that. Well, in my view, this is one of the SNPs that is pretty common in a lot of autistic children. It's also pretty common in bipolar conditions. It's also pretty common in people who are more report being depressed or are on antidepressants more often than not. But it represents a family of these little SNPs. And so you, you can actually get this also as a test. You go to your docs and I would, you can even get it at 23andMe. So 23andMe or Heritage when you get that work done and you get it in your raw data, but uh, maybe it's easier. Back before 23andMe, we would actually have to order this. For instance, Quest, we'd, ha we'd check off a few genetics tests. So this would be one of the genetic tests we'd check off. And you'd want to see if you had this SNP from your father and your mother. So were you heterozygous or homozygous? Did you have it on, did you have it at all for one? Did you have it on one set of chromosomes? Did you have it on the other set of chromosomes? So as an example, for this layer, so we now talked about fats, how fats make a big deal for you in your lifestyle, just having that fat choice and changing the ratio from 20 to one to one to one. That is incredibly a big deal. Oh, so from all those conditions I've told you about, I can go more. What, let's say throw in multiple sclerosis, on and on and on. But now we're adding in another level of looking for a particular SNP. And so this whole idea of, this is actually called nutrigenomics. It's a name that's sort of been tossed around, and that's between genes and nutrition. So you look for these SNPs. And for these particular SNPs, that means these people have a problem of, of methylating a particular um, nutrients like B12 and folate and so on. So they need a specific kind of supplement to make up. And this is a, one of the rare situations in which a supplement actually will help out for these particular people. So can you imagine that? I've just now given you two things. So if you were listening to this because, oh my gosh, I heard about bipolar and if I change my fats, I'm not going to repeat that anymore. If I change my fats, that's a difference. Now, if you actually look for some basic uh, with your physician, look for some basic SNPs, your polymorphisms. MTHFR is one, but there's different variations and there's a whole little methylation cluster of other uh, polymorphisms. Now I told you that everybody has basically so many different types, but they've made these associations with certain types of polymorphisms that you can find out, you know, that you have, and therefore some of these can easily be supplemented. There's not a lot. There's not a, a, long, a laundry list of SNPs now that can be treated with and benefit by supplements, but some actually do. And so the MTHFR is one, and there's a few others that can be uh, supported with supplementation. So in my way of looking at uh, and working with patients, you that's why the diet was so important. You would then look at their diet, and we asked them to do that. Remember that diet diary, seven-day diet diary? They came in, we did the their blood work, we looked at some of their genes, uh, or if they did 23andMe, they would we download the raw data, take a look at that. We see what is in this range of things that we can comfortably treat. And if they said, "Hey, I want to just go treat my SNPs that you discovered that I have, but I don't want to change my diet," that is not a good process. That is absolutely not a good process because they're going to continue to eat crap and bad things. And the change that you're helping them make for the better is not is going to be not a pin, a pin in a haystack, but it's going to be far too little. And you've left too much of the damaging stuff that they're doing in their diet still existing. So you have to change the diet. You have to change those fat ratios. And then you can look in for the next level. Uh, and this is, this is actually very significant. So in uh, the autism, so in my reality of the autistic kids that I saw, which were not a lot, but there was enough on a constant flow, we absolutely told them, of course, don't do dairy and don't do gluten. And you went through the whole fish oil thing, and uh, which is harder for autistic kids to put that in. And if you could have their parents, you know, have them change over to uh, one of the ketogenic diets often that are used for epilepsy as well, that would be a huge change. And then when if you did a genetic test and found out that, you know, there are some SNPs that are relevant to that, that you could treat some of those SNPs, then you have made a significant difference in that individual's life. But that's how we proceeded. 
was an upper level thing to do. Um, some physicians just like to tweak the SNPs and so on because it's kind of a sexy thing to look at, but it's very incomplete if you don't address the dietary deficiencies uh, that I've just spoke about on the fats. I didn't go into others. So with that, I'm going to wrap it up. I hope it wasn't too complicated, but we're going to go into other fats down the road and how it's very important because there again, I'm asking you to think back to what the heck does this have to do with a ketogenic diet? So I'm going to tie that together. I'm going to say that because I went into that ketones were a metabolic signaling agent for so many other things, when you couple that aspect and with changing your fats, and we look at another level on a per condition basis of some of their SNPs, single nuclear polymorphisms, you now have a very potent way to address a number of different issues. Okay? All right. So till next time, I know this was an earful. Hope, hope you benefited from it. And feel free to continue sending these questions. I try to work them into my talks. Um, as you've probably noticed, uh, feel free to send in a like or any sort of feedback on any of the different platforms you're listening to. So until next time, this is Dr. Carl Goldcamp, and I so appreciate your time. Take care. Thanks for listening. For anybody who has any questions, feel free to contact me on our Facebook group, Keto Naturopath, same name as our podcast. I'm open to any questions, and we plod through the good and the bad, the difficult and the easy, week after week.